Hello, boa tarde. Como está todo mundo? Espero que estejam todos bem, todas bem, prontas e prontos para uma tarde, mais uma tarde cheia de aprendizagem. Bem-vindas, bem-vindos e bem-vindos, então. É, hoje a nossa tarde será em língua inglesa, né? Como vocês podem ver pelos títulos e os resumos das falas que estão lá no, no nosso site, né? No dela.fpr.br. É, como eu disse na abertura da segunda-feira passada, a língua de cada tarde, de cada interação, foi escolhida pelas nossas convidadas e pelos nossos convidados. E a gente vai fazer o possível para legendar os vídeos né, que vão ficar gravados e para disponibilizar esses vídeos legendados o quanto antes, né, na, ideia, na, na tentativa de tentar ampliar né, o acesso para o maior número possível de pessoas. É, eu queria lembrar também que, infelizmente, nós não conseguimos intérpretes de libras para outras línguas que não o português. Então, a gente só vai ter as intérpretes conosco nas falas que acontecerem em português, tá bom? Então, good afternoon, everyone, again. Buenas tardes. Um, it is a great honor and a great pleasure to be here to conduct our discussions this afternoon. Uh, with all of you on YouTube, of course, and with today's guests. So um, let me start with my audio description. Um, my name is Clarissa. I'm a white woman in my late 50s. I have short, curly, gray hair, uh, medium-sized, sometimes I think it's uh, way too big, but a medium-sized nose and small lips. Um, I'm wearing a black T-shirt with... Um, colorful cat patterns. Um, I'm also wearing small glass earrings and glasses with a rectangular dark frame. Behind me, there is a large wooden cupboard to my right and a small chest of drawers to my left with a lamp, with a lamp and some books on it. Uh, above it, there is a small shelf with more books and some small teddy bears and a black face mask I'm very proud of, where we can read Fora Bolsonaro in white. That's basically it. So, um, as usual, we will start the afternoon with our guests' introductions, and then our local guest, who today is Miguel, will present his research, and our external guest, Sharon, today, will start the debate with him. Um, but, of course, the debate will be followed by the questions that come up on our YouTube chat. Then we'll have a short break, followed by our external guests talk and the debate initiated this time by Miguel, but again taken up by everyone on the chat as well. So get your um, keyboards ready. <laughs> get, get your... Um, your questions, your comments, your suggestions ready. Okay, so without further ado, let's move on to today's guests, who I am really thrilled to have with us at DELA. 
So let me call Sharon to the screen first so you can see her. Hi, Sharon. Um, I have known Sharon for some time already, though I wish our conversations could have happened more often, Sharon. Um, I do admire her intelligence. I think she's very sharp and um, I love the way the tender way, and she'll be talking about tenderness today. So I love the way she uh, brings up tenderness while making us question ourselves and everything around us. So thanks, Sharon, for being here with us today. Um, and let me call Miguel now. So this is, this is the main trio for the afternoon. Uh, Miguel. Oh, Miguel, what, what am I going to say about Miguel? Miguel, I think Miguel is responsible for making one of my dreams to begin to come true, which is a closer contact with Latin America, right, Miguel, our um, Abya Yala, that um, Miguel and the Colombian professors and teachers he has introduced to me have kind of opened up a window perhaps also a door, or perhaps a whole house <laughs> of rewarding collaborations and learning. So thank you very much for that, Miguel. I'll never get tired of stressing how important these contacts have been to me. And of course, thank, thanks, Miguel, for being here with us today. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start, I'm going to send them to the backstage again and we are going to start now showing the this special treat for the participants who are watching us uh, online right now live which is sharing with you the um, texts the videos the 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 poems images songs whatever the guests felt could represent them for us here at Bella. So let's go now to the material that our two guests of the day sent us for their introduction. So I'll first show you the video sent by Miguel. So here it is. Okay, so there's more where that came from. All you have to do is check on, on the website. And um, I think Sharon is also going to... Um, to mention the the website where you can find uh you know the whole text so now that we are simultaneously relaxed and nervous about all the things we should stop doing <laughs> let's go on with uh today's talk so um uh, miguel my dear the screen is yours thank you very much and welcome once again Thank you, Clarissa, and uh, boa tarde, good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes para todas y todos. Uh, before I start, I would like to share my screen. And could you please confirm if you are looking at the slide number one, the first slide? Yes. Yes, perfect. Thank okay. You. So let's start. Uh, well. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you. It's always a pleasure to participate in this. I think that are, th this is not like a, you know, very uh, academic event, but I think it's a very fruitful um, interaction with four and um, from others. My other I, I think I am going to be part of your life, part of your desires and part of your feelings. The name of my presentation is A Decolonial Critical Option in ELT, English Language Teaching, Struggles, Uncertainties and Possibilities with and um, for students at a public school here in Bogota, Colombia. I am Miguel Martinez. I'm an ELT educator. And once again, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this chance to present our reality, our context, and our uncertainties 
here in my country. So let's start. Uh, can you hear me perfectly? Could you please confirm? Yes, perfect. Yes? All right, <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, um, this is not a very straight agenda. Of course, this is not so a structural one, but I would like to tell you something about myself, a short introduction. I would like to say something from a very starting point, also some perspectives, a reflection, um, a theory to analyze, perhaps it could be very important in the presentation, some local assumptions, and finally, I would like to get a group discussion, I mean, here together. The idea in this presentation is to, well, let's yeah, try to create a great atmosphere after this beautiful Sharon's presentation. I'm very relaxed, by the way. I think this is a good chance to interact, I mean, here with the people, with the participants, of course, to learn together. And finally, to have like some conclusions or some reflections, okay? Um, la idea al principio era brindar la charla en español, pero bueno, está in English. In English, I think it's not a problem. I, English is my first language, but my native one is an indigenous language. Language, probably in the future, I will get, you know, a talk in a in an indigenous native language, okay? So let's start. Thank you, Dela, for this, you know, for this space. Uh, the coloniality and applied linguistics is one of the, I think, biggest concerns here in Colombia, especially in the ELT field, in the English language teaching in education field. And something that I forget to tell you at the very beginning, excuse me if you listen to people at my background, you know, with the sound, because uh, I will, I'm gonna be so honest. I'm in class right now with my students, okay? Uh, here, they are working, they are, well, working, they are learning together. They are doing a group work activity and they are finishing the, the class, in, the lesson in 10 minutes. I think it can be interrupt the presentation, but, as I said at the, you know, at the beginning of the presentation with my colleagues, this is the real context. And well, let, let, let's do it, okay? Well, um, let's start with this short, um, well, introduction. That's me and Miguel Martinez, but I'm also, you, you know, Luciana's daddy. I'm a daddy, Luciana, she's my daughter. I mean, she's a marvelous girl, so intelligent and um more than happy to be in her life and i really appreciate this opportunity in my life also i'm a student well currently i'm conducting my phd studies in education i'm a phd candidate in education and the major is elt elt in education this is the emphasis this is the major but also i'm an elt educator in bogota colombia in a public school the name of the school is Ricaurte, Ricaurte School. It is located in the south of the city. Um, it's a public school. Mm, too many realities here from students. And, you know, uh, I think this is the real context an educator should be faced. I mean, should be involved. The school in total has more than 1,200 students and they represent, um, let's say, a not privileged strata here in, in Bogota. I mean, uh, here in Bogota, we have different strata from one to six, and most of my students from most of my community are in the first, you know, lower, let's say lower, not privileged um, stands. I mean, they are from one and two strata. Uh, well, uh, it means they have really hard conditions, especially in terms of the poverty, uh, let's say, um, the security, in terms of uh, they are going to be stolen maybe in tomorrow, maybe this afternoon, because the violence in this specific place is so hard. And also because of their families uh, represent what we need to learn from and what what we need to be involved. Well, this is the school where I am 
you know, <laughs> doing the presentation right now. And well, let's start the, the presentation. Well, the name of this talk is the coloniality and criticality, especially in the ELT field. But first of all, I would like to do a, an exercise about the ABC of the coloniality and criticality. And I would like to share your ideas in a Padlet. So there are two questions. Of course, there are no direct questions or top-down uh, process questions, but I would like uh, to know something about the decolonial project. What did you know about the decolonial project? And also some ideas about criticality or the crit or critical stance, well, not just in education, in general. Um, I don't know if you can share the link. Uh, somebody who can help me to share the link here in the chat. And I we will have like one or two minutes to write our ideas in the Padlet. Can it be can it be okay for you? Yes. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Yes. And now I'm going to share the Padlet with the information that you have. Okay. Just in some seconds, I'm going to share the Padlet with you. Your microphone is off, so we can't hear you now. Would you like me to share? The yes. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm sharing. I'm sharing the Padlet with the two questions: the colonial, the decolonial project, and about uh, criticality. And here we have the panel of idea, the ideas in the panel about these two. Uh, let's say, yeah these two stands, these two pro these two aspects. People are writing, yes, people are participating, yes. Okay, people continue participating, I guess. Well, we, we don't need to write, you know, too much information, just key aspects about the decolonial project and criticality. Yes, here we have. Uh, yes, guys, you can go out. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, perfect. There are some, yeah, both are both envisioning other ways of being, knowing, making meaning, being in touch and bringing to the educational context. Yeah, it is about questions, isn't it? Yeah, I deeply agree about that. Identifying, interrogating and interrupting the colonial project. I really enjoy reading this this post. Thank you guys. Bye bye. I'm sorry, my students are leaving. Okay. Thinking otherwise. Bye bye guys. Thank you. Bye. All right. Perfect. Um. I would like to ask you something. I mean, here for the organizers in the in this talk to take like a I don't know like a picture to take a photo of these comments. However, I have the information here in the Padlet. But if we can see here, there are so many opinions. Many well, let's say um, 
personal, political, and social, I think, social political opinions about the coloniality and criticality. And this is what I would like to do in this presentation, to reflect upon our social political, uh, let's say, impact, in this case, in education, all right? And there are too many terrific ideas, okay? Of course, also in Spanish, ver el mundo por otros ojos. Ese otro yo, ¿no? Ese, you know, uh, oh, eh, my other myself, okay? My, uh, my another I, my another myself, all right? Great. I will stop sharing, um, well, the Padlet, and let me move with the another part of the presentation, which is basically about the summarizing of these ideas, okay? Thank you for your participation, for your comments. I really appreciate it. And of course, I'm learning too much from this, you know, perspective from this project and also from the stance that, and also the opinions you are, um, you are writing here. Now, I continue the presentation. Yes. Here we are. Yeah. I'm sorry to ask you too many times. Can you please confirm if you can see that the coloniality and criticality ABC yes. slide? Yes, thanks. It's working. Perfect. So, uh, well, if we have time, I would like to share again our ideas in the Padlet. I mean, a, a screenshot, it could be, um, in order to reflect again about our assumptions about our feelings and our desires and of course our thoughts in the decoloniality and criticality uh, to be honest i would like to tell you something personal and it is about the decolonial project i'm learning from this project and to be honest it's not easy to learn from the project because uh, i don't feel sometimes clarissa knows because uh, well she's a really close friend and Clarissa knows for me it has been it has been painful, painful especially because I'm an English as a foreign language teacher. So it means um, let's say teaching lessons in a colonial, let's say language, but also I'm learning with my students from this language, right? I'm going to tell you some aspects about this painful and these hard situations. And of course it pains and I have some scars in my, you know, in my skin, in my soul and in my learning process. But well, let's talk about a little bit all about, yeah, about the coloniality and criticality. Some perspectives, um, this is not the just one truth. This is not just the one concept perhaps about criticality and the coloniality, but I chose this idea. First one, criticality in education. Criticality deals with a disposition for purposeful thinking and acting guided by criteria that are considered to be contextually appropriate and that are expected to result in positive outcomes related, related to the purpose. Of course, the criticality deals with aspects such as social transformations, inequalities, power issues among other aspects, but this is just in terms of education about criticality. What is my opinion about criticality, for example, in my local context? Well, I think we as ELT educators or as educators, we should keep in mind those outcomes, those contexts, if you allow me to use it in plural, right? And of course, the results of these, you know, outcomes. This is about criticality, but also in the coloniality, I would like to share with you this. I took, of course, from the, from the thinkers in the decolonial project, yeah, no scholars, thinkers, uh, learners, you know, and the coloniality is an emerging movement from Latin America that focuses on understanding modernity in the context of a form of critical theory applied to ethnic studies. It has been described, described as consisting of analytical and practical options that confront a disengage from the 
colonial matrix of power. It has also been referred to as kind of radical exteriority thinking. And I really love uh, two questions uh, Sharon uh, stated in 2019. And the first one is, what if the colonialization requires us to laugh at ourselves with humility rather than posture radically? Great one. The second one, what if the colonization requires that we together learn from all mistakes, right? Well, from, from my position as, you know, Mestizo, Mestizo is the name of a combination between indigenous people and white Spanish, Mestizo, uh, and also as ELT educator, I would like to say that it's a need to know and especially to reflect upon the decolonial project. Um, and it's a must. No, I think it's not a must. I think it's a need because uh, we are wandering in very hard times. I mean, we are passing over the times and we need to believe about our epistemologies in plural again and our ways of acting, our ways of learning, and of course, our ways of doing something remarkable, meaningful, I don't know, but something in our local contexts. And I think it's a beautiful opportunity that we need to keep in mind, especially here in education, in educational contexts. Well, this is about criticality and decoloniality, but also uh, I took, you know, uh, yeah, I got information from the critical option and the colonial project, but in the ELT field, in the English language teaching field. The first one is in my left, yeah, my left, yeah. The first one is from my teacher, Harold Castañeda, and he, sa he says, if an English language teacher doesn't pronounce the language like a native speaker, a covert assumption of the colonial device whiteness realized in forms of racism, racism, then this teacher doesn't comply with the fallacy of the native speaker. Example, English language teachers should be native like pronunciation. Of course it happens. Well, here, here in my school, here in the school where I work, um, I realize um, students pay special attention on the pronunciation. Of the of the of the English teacher, let's say English language teacher, English teacher, and um, well, there are there are some ways of racism when the teacher, when the educator, is not speaking properly. When I am talking properly, is like what is the proper English speak spoken, right? I mean. This is one of my concerns. Of course, I have many mistakes when I'm speaking English, uh, especially because I'm a human and I, I do have mistakes. And second, because I think uh, we need to be very humble, as uh, Sharon stated in the, in the questions. Um, I, I need to be so humble with, with the learning process because uh, this is not an authority about learning a language. This is not a vertical, you know, option. It should be like horizontal. And I think this special part on pronunciation plays a relevant role in the decolonial project, especially in the ELT field. In the middle here, in this column, we have some critical options in the ELT field. The first one is from Pennycook. It says, in a reflexive turn which acknowledges the socio-historical reality of English and ELT, that is, their colonial past. Great. We're talking about socio-historical realities it, from a critical uh, perspective. The second one, Philipson, their neo-colonial present realized in relatively sophisticated forms of linguistic imperialism. Um, and I would like to add something from this quote, not uh, imperialism plus a neoliberal uh, ideas, neoliberalism, all right? Kumarawa Dibelu, Kuma, uh, he said, the development of post-method pedagogies. Um, 
we are not talking just about one pedagogy, one truth. There are many, of course. Carmen Elena Guerrero, another teacher here in, in, um, in Colombia, I'm sorry, she said, teacher identity in official educational discourses. I really love when I'm, I really love reading uh, Carmen Elena's um, position because she, she states the importance of official education policies in the ELT. And we should criticize those policies. And of course, we should keep in mind some ideas related to, uh, you know, identities of teachers. Inclusivity, McLuder, ELT and ne neoliberalism, I already mentioned, and critical teacher education. And here, another person, well, all this information was taken from uh, Banegas uh, Darío, a teacher here in Colombia. And finally, I would like to mention something really important in this research. Uh, well, just a clarification here. I'm, I'm running out this, uh, well, this project is running. I mean, uh, it is starting. And if you notice, I haven't posted like the lead review or the objectives of the project. Why? Because um, this is the first stage of the project, which is, you know, uh, my concerns, uh, some possibilities, and I think we need we need to keep in mind there is something here to to analyze, to reflect upon, and of course to learn. Um, but if you notice the the project, more than a project, more than a research, very you know like academic research, there are like some assumptions, some wonders that I that, that I have here from a critical option and the decolonial project. Finally, in Brazil, Rodriguez and Albuquerque and Miller, indigenous teachers can be empowered as the primary decision makers in the development of the ELT curricula and instructions in their roles as experts on local knowledge and practices in their indigenous contexts. And thus, the possibility that subaltern indigenous learners of English can be heard becomes more tangible. I have one, two, three. I have five, six. I have six indigenous students here in, in the school. And I will tell you something about these students. And with this, I start talking about the local realities while teaching EFL. Let me start with, yes, with this. Linguistic racism, poverty, and violence. But before starting with these two, you know, like uh, overviews, of the local realities, I, I told you something about my indigenous students and some experiences that I have been facing on is the importance of English for them. And two weeks ago, one of the students asked me, Miguel, uh, I need to know why, of course, in Spanish, in a, let's say, bad Spanish, because his native language is Wayu, Wayu is a language from here in the, in the coast, in Guajira, right? And he told me in Spanish, why, por qué él debe aprender inglés? ¿Cuál es la necesidad? What is the need of learning, you know, English? He doesn't understand. And it's totally valid. And I really appreciate uh, this question. And eventually I was scared of replying something because uh, I'm not in his position. I have never been in an indigenous community with his cosmovision, with uh, his way of, you know, uh, understanding ideas and assuming some knowledges in plural. And I was like scared and I was in panic. And I said, what? Uh, I replied with another question. I'm sorry, but I did it. <laughs> and I asked him, well, why do you think? And he said, oh, because everybody speaks this language and everybody understands. And I was like, oh my God, yeah, that's true, all right? But he learns English not just as, as a power issue, because English is here, Guayu language is here, Spanish in the middle. No, 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 as a possibility. 
And I really appreciate that because it is the local um, experience. It's my local reality. It's the reality in a public school and especially with indigenous students. This is to, you know, to connect the idea of the last uh, quote from uh, indigenous teachers. They should, they should be seen as experts, you know, in the, in the, in the language. And they should be like, you know, positioned uh, as, you know, as an authority in the language, because I think uh, they can offer us too many good aspects, not just in education, but in the ELT field. Well, talking about these two aspects very briefly, I would like to tell you something about linguistic racism and poverty and violence. Uh, my students, teachers, the community, my community, I am facing linguistic racism, poverty, violence, but especially in these aspects. There are some difficulties, struggles, and of course, challenges of the real world. Um, there is an elitism perpetuated in the ELT field, okay? Um, I also realize some of my friends, you know, other ELT teachers, English language teachers, EFL teachers, they feel like superior when they are teaching lessons in English, just because they, 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 they speak just because they, you know, they, they can talk in a different language, not a Guayu language, not a native, you know, not a indigenous language. No, 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 English, right? And I can, I can feel this um, situation and I was, uh, well, I am, was wondering and now I am working on that and I am learning from this because there is an elitism perpetuated in our field in the English language teach. And this is something that I would like to keep in mind in the future, to bear in mind, because I think there is too much to uh, analyze and to co-construct. The second one is this, about language proficiency, inequalities, and connectivity with the government. Uh, I think it's a very particular situation in Colombia, but very similar with, uh, with the Brazilian people, with my friends, with you, uh, there, uh, I don't know if it is just here in Colombia. I think it's not because I have been in many uh, <laughs> events in Brazil and I, ha I have many friends there. And I think we have the same challenges and struggles, especially with language proficiency inequalities. What does that mean? Um, you know, here in the school, in Colombia, in the ELT field, you are going to be, uh, let's say, you are going to be located in a specific level. If you are C1, if you are B2, if you are B1, and people pay special attention on the level. But there are too many inequalities, for example, here in the school, because there are some students here who can interpret the language, let's say English, in a, in a well way in a well, in a fun way, right? But there are others they can understand and I can not give you a specific, let's say, uh, brands for the student. Oh, you are A1. Come on, Mr. B1. Come on, Mrs. B2. Come on. No, 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 no. I think there are many inequalities in here in terms of the language proficiency. And also the government is, uh, how can I say softly? Um, it's a pain in my in the you know in the in the process because the government doesn't give us support especially of the connectivity right now with the pandemia with the covid with you know all these requirements and we don't have here a special you know um possibilities to teach a class we don't have even a tv just a board and chairs and i think this is the re the reality i mean this is the reality we are facing right now and I'm not crying, of course, but well, if we want to work in group, everybody should work in a very sociopolitical position. I think we need to we need to claim about. I mean, our voices should be heard. And what are our voices? The teachers' voices. And this part about the government is something is something really bad, especially uh, here in the in the country. Lack of social political awareness and also knowledge base of local ELT educators, okay? Many ELT educators have great, um, uh, great ideas to do something incredible, 
But here, uh, we don't pay attention in the local community, from the local community. We pay attention more from north, from the west, and I don't understand why, but I think we are in the, not the correct way. I think this is not the correct way, but we are in the way, we are in the path for reflecting upon about our epistemologies, our knowledge, our, our knowledge bases, right? Well, to finish the presentation, because Clarissa, could you do me a favor? Can you please tell me how much time do I have for finishing? Five minutes? Okay. Um, you have, no, you have, 20, uh, you have 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Because I am starting the present. No, 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 I'm kidding. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm almost finishing. It's a 30 okay. minutes altogether. So you started a little bit earlier. So you, yeah, you still have some 10, 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, but I, I really need this alert because I start talking and sometimes I am talking about other things and other aspects and well, for the correct path, for the correct structural way. No, 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 not the structural, but look, this slide is related to some options and possibilities from my yes. local. Sorry, um, I, I can't count properly. Uh, in fact, you have five minutes at the most. Perfect. My, no, my it's bad. okay. It's okay. No worries. So, uh, from my local reflection, when I'm talking, my is the community. From my locals community reflection, I would like to well mention these options and possibilities. The number one is that learning a language, French, Italian, Japanese, should be a possibility, not a power issue. Uh, from a very critical stand, from a very critical view, I think English, for example, in that case, English as a foreign language should be learned uh, as a possibility. And my students, the learners, are are doing are doing that. Uh, I don't know if correctly or not, but they see the language in with some possibilities in the future. Second, I think it's crucial, relevant to include activities within local contexts. Um, from my experience, I will say um, I can, you know, I can talk from a very local view, you know, thinking globally, but acting out locally. There are too many stories here in my country, here in Bogota, for example. Why don't we teach, we give a lesson of past past events, but talking about Monserrate, which is a very wonderful hill here in Bogota, instead of talking about, uh, I don't know, Estatua de la Libertad in the US. It's an example, the Big Ben in, in London, I don't know, you know, including activities with local contexts, but not just talking about the local context from a very intercultural you know, possibility to explore more about our local contexts in English. Why not? Third one, pay special attention to students' likes and dislikes. That's incredible. Okay, I can I can repeat the activities from myself when I was learning English. I remember I've heard Hotel California, the song. You know, but this is my like. This is what <laughs> what I like, not the students' one, right? So I think in a in a decolonial possibility, we need to learn with uh, with the students and from the students. And we need to be, uh, once again, very humble when we are giving lessons because we can learn a lot from them. And of course, this is a horizontal, uh, let's say, situation when we are, you know, uh, giving lessons here in the class. And finally, the last but not the least, we, the ELT educators, we have our own way to carry out classes. Uh, there is a perpetuated structure in the ELT field that we prepare the classes with a presentation, practice, and production. English teachers who are here, they know that. We have a presentation at the very beginning, which is a warm up. The warm up is created by an uh, author, so we need to follow for a wonderful class, for a very meaningful activity. Then we have transitions. Transitions were made or were designed by uh, this, you know, Northwest author. And yeah, how about our, our 
our own way to carry out the classes, to give the lessons. So I don't know if it is a scramble, if it is a mess, but we have, we have to keep in mind our epistemologies in the ELT field. We follow the structure. I think we are, and I'm including in this bus, in the, you know, very structural bus, I have been following the structure of the ELT lessons. But how about our own way to carry out the classes or the horizontality in the EFL classes? And finally, because I have two minutes, yes, I have some reflections, of course, some questions. This presentation, if you notice, um, is, um, you know, uh, like rounded from many questions. And the first one is, are the common or traditional methods helping us, the ELT education, educators during teaching classes? How could, how could we bring out our classes from a decolonial project? I think it's hard. And of course, I am, you know, I, I am, I start thinking about my first, um, let's say, comment in this presentation, it says like, it's very difficult for me to think in a decolonial project from a decolonial view, because I'm an English teacher. Some people think I'm white. Uh, I'm a privileged person here. Uh, I don't, you know, but I think I am working with the community, from the community, of the community, and there are some wonders and also some challenges that I guess perhaps I should keep in mind, right? Because I feel better and I feel more comfortable when I am thinking about the others I need, my, my needs, which are the other ones. Three questions that I would like, I would like to finish the presentation. Number one, Quinoa. Uh, well, this is a nickname. Este no es el nombre real. Quinoa, él dijo, ¿por qué debo hablar inglés? ¿Para qué me va a servir? Quinoa, it's a Guayú student. Guayú, uh, indigenous population here in Colombia. ¿Por qué debo hablar inglés? Why do I need to learn English or speak English? All the class, the world class, eight graders. Es más simple y agradable, excuse me aquí, a mistake in Spanish. Es más simple y agradable cuando nos cuenta una historia en español. Usted, Miguel. You know, it's easier and you know, uh, better when you are telling us a story in Spanish instead of English. Look. And the last one. Uh, this is from a teacher, a colleague. Of course, this is not uh, his real name. No me siento bien cuando hablo en inglés. Las personas no entienden lo que quiero decir. Oh, my God. I don't feel well when I'm speaking English because the people don't understand what I, what I say. To keep in mind um, these, uh, let's say, wonders. And well, thank you very much. Uh, the first one is in Guayu, Guayu language, Anayacuga. Obrigado, gracias, and thank you. The, it was a presentation about the decolonial and critical option in ELT education. Me pasé dos minutos, Clarissa, I'm sorry. Don't worry, Miguel, don't worry. Um, thank you very much, Miguel, for this. Um, it's, you know, it always strikes me the resemblance, the similarities um, be between our realities. Um, I think there's, we have a lot in common. People have been talking here on the chat of uh, how, you know, meaningful this all is to us and how um, it resonates with our own contexts and our own experiences in uh, teaching. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'll bring Sharon to the screen now. Sharon. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so Sharon, um, it's up to you to start the conversation with Miguel. And then, uh, you know, as soon as you've asked one or two questions, then we can bring Daniele uh, here uh, with the questions from the web chat as well. So thanks a lot, Sharon. 
Gracias. Um, thank you so much, Miguel, for this talk. I always learn some, I'm not a linguist or a language teacher, so I always learn so much about this context that's quite different from mine. Uh, but one of the things that really resonated was in my context, we have many international students coming to Canada. Um, and in many cases, they have actually arrived with the promise of the Canadian dream in their hearts. And then I get them, especially in my class, about um, critical and decolonial perspectives on internationalization. And they have this crisis moment um, where they start to see the colonial power relations that have structured even their arrival in Canada, as well as the experiences they actually have when they're here. And even uh, last week in a discussion, I had a student from Mexico uh, who had this sort of existential question crisis of, okay, we are saying that this um, the importation of Western education around the world, as well as the arrival of students here is part of this colonial pattern. But can I really say to my family or my friends in Mexico that they shouldn't be wanting this because it's a colonial desire? Is it really, is it right for me to do that? Is it wrong for them to want it? And so it, it really resonated with so many of the questions about students asking why English? Is this, is this worth our while? What are we doing? This is clearly part of a, a colonial project. And so I'm wondering, um, in your case, how you navigate this, and I'll just share a little bit about what I do and then pass it to you, and then I'll pass also to the, to the rest of the questions because I want especially the linguists to be able to ask you and the English teachers and other language teachers. Um, but one, one of the things I do is try and think about it as, this is a, a colonial game that has been set up by the White West. And I think of it partly in my as my role as a as a teacher to uh, invite students to consider the socio historical conditions that have brought us to this place where learning English or coming to study in Canada feels like the only or the best option, especially to have some sense of security and not being constantly worried about you know how you're going to find money to eat. Um, so it's it's letting them think through how the game is set up, how the game is rigged, but also saying, here are the rules. And it's probably never gonna work exactly in your favor if you're already um, you know, many steps behind the, the starting line in the, in the colonial power relations, but it's up to you to decide, do you want to play the game? Do you want to refuse the game? Do you want to try and subvert the game, which is, what many of us here probably are trying to do, sort of playing it, but also trying to play it against itself, knowing that it's always gonna be playing us more than we can sort of subvert it. Um, and I think that's my role. And then the students decide and their families decide what they wanna do with sort of this contextual information of how to move forward, while also knowing that the game is set up in a system that's totally unsustainable, <laughs> that there's no way we can have this global middle class without using uh, more than the, the Earth's resources, right? So trying to provide all of that context and invite them to dig deep and then say, and what you do with this is, is up to you and what your sense of responsibility is, what your sense of what you can do in your context. And um, I'm just wondering how you kind of negotiate that, that kind of dynamic in, in, with your students. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I, just, I just wrote here, um, colonial game because I found really interesting. Um, and this game, this colonial game has many options, uh, many possibilities. And I think one of the purposes in my teacher's position deals with uh, bringing possibilities to students. But what kind of possibilities? Because um, they have some desires, they have some wishes, and you know, I, I can't tell the students, no, you are not going to do that. You are not going to find out this. You are not going to travel. You are not, yeah? Perhaps they, they will never travel. Perhaps, and that's, this is a huge possibility of this. But look, uh, Sharon, uh, I, I think the language is a vehicle to give them options First of all, to realize that it's important for them somewhere, somehow, because uh, probably they are going to talk to, uh, I don't know, an American person, a British person. And here you have 
the option in this colonial game. Okay, first of all, you are not going to be on panic when a person is talking to you. This is the first joke. Uh, well, I think it's a joke because for them, it's, uh, it's a laughing time. When I am talking in English, some of them are, are smiling, are, you know, like laughing, like, <laughs> why? But this is not because uh, it's funny, it's because they are nervous. This is something related to emotions. Second one, Sharon, I really appreciate that you come up with uh, the idea with uh, negotiations, but not just with the students myself, I mean, in my teachers, uh, in my position as an educator. You know, um, I'm changing a lot. And my subjectivity is in constant, you know, uh, movement. And sometimes I feel they need to know English because they need to be part of this game. And because if the, their families desire, not them. But to be honest, I think students should be seen as a project. They are seen as a reality, I mean, right now. And I think it's also a problem in education. Education sees, you know, looks at the students as a project. You know, the students as a huge project system in the future. But they are acting out now, and they can offer us many different things. And I deeply agree, education in general is not the solution. What kind of education is the solution? Because uh, here in my country, two blocks from here, uh, there are uh, gangsters uh, or robbers here who have a special education system. So is the, uh, is the education the, you know, the, the result, the, the main objective? I think it's not. I think the problem is what kind of education. So now in the English language teaching, is the English the solution? Ah, uh, what kind of English or Englishes? Englishes, you know, uh, in the um, in uh, Ophelia Garcia's words, right? So um, to sum up, uh, this colonial game has many options, and these options should be like stated and should be given to them all the options, and that's another problem, especially here. I don't give them all the options just some of them and i think our job our objective is to bring a repertoire you know too many options especially for learning for learning a foreign language thank you sharon i hope it could be uh, not solved but reflected the, the the question yeah we could talk about this forever so let's have another dela in 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 uh, six months to discuss <laughs> <laughs> this more specifically because it's it's really very very complex i think the whole situation lots of dimensions into it but then let's let's see what people have been talking about and focusing on the web chat Danieli, can i bring you to the screen can you come you can come on your own be brave yay <laughs> hi yes i'm already here Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here again, learning a lot from our speakers and also from the conversation we have in our chat. It's really exciting to see how people react to our talk. So first of all, Miguel, the question is for you. Juliani Silva, uh, she's saying, where do you think that the colonial project meets the critical project uh, thought in the English language teaching field. All right, like the connection. If I understand the question between the decolonial project with uh, with the critical uh, with the critical view, um, well, that's a tricky one. <laughs> and I was, you know, researching and learning, of course, reading about it. And I think, uh, and I come up one of the comments in the Padlet, which is related to identification, interrogation, and interruption. And I think it's uh, Lin Mario's also reflection, and I was talking to him like some months ago of, uh, with Clarissa, and I realized there are some encounters between the criticality and the decoloniality. And the first one is that we need to identify not the problem, the reality. But we need to interrogate this, you know, this aspect. And finally, we need to interrupt. How to interrupt? Well, it's our decision 
um, I think the decolonial project and also the criticality doesn't mean that it's wrong and bad. It's black and white. I think, well, you know, this is like a rainbow. And this rainbow, in this rainbow, the criticality and the coloniality perhaps are connected from identification, interrogation, and interruption, especially of the colonial structure. Uh, really complex, I know. And um, once again, it pains a lot. But yeah, I think this is like the common um, or interconnected aspect between the critical view and also the uh, decolonial project. One more question here, Pedro Tapajos. Is all teachers can read and write, but can we act? Can we erode the pillars of hierarchy and adopt our rhizomatic origins? Can we become co-actors in the building of community? I'm reading the question because it's also it's also so challenging. Um, I guess this this question goes for both of you, right? So yes, how do we act facing all this uh, violence and um, all these problems that we're facing? What, what do we do? <laughs> yes, it, I think. Um, can, can can I start just to say something very briefly, and it deals with. Um, uh, it deals with the sociopolitical impact that teacher should have a time of acting, time of, you know, uh, of working. I, I think we can become co-actors in the building of the community, but when we are offering the community welfare, when we are offering something, I think at this specific part, we are political actors and we are political we are in the political movement because um we are here for helping people and this is so yeah romantic this is a romantic story you know but how can we do that from my position or in the teaching in the teaching way right so to sum up co-actors but in a very social political position just to to analyze and to reflect upon this uh, really challenging uh, question. Thank you. Sharon? Sure. Um, well, I think one initial response, and this is not a, certainly not a deflection of the question of how do we act, but I definitely find in, in my context at least, once people start to actually wrestle with the um, scope and scale and depth of the problems we face, there's often this rush to act. And we don't spend the time and the space to actually sit with what Miguel said, the reality of how <laughs> effed up we really are <laughs> and how the planet is suffering from our actions, unevenly so in terms of humanity, but and because we're scared of feeling that sense of disillusion, disillusionment or lack, lack, lack of hope or um, the fear that this won't continue as promised, all of these things become almost overwhelming for us to hold. So part of what I try to do also in my, my pedagogy is ask how we can build the capacity to actually sit with this without wanting to run away. And sometimes the desire to act is because we can't sit with the full extent of, of the problem and our complicity in the problem. But that being said, that can also become um, an excuse to continue with business as usual, right? So it's, it can't become this, I'm just gonna look at my belly button and think about my complicity either. Um, so in that, in that sense, in terms of action, I think we can think of different scales. We, we do need to think short, medium, and long-term about what is, is possible. And sometimes when, when I have students who are feeling immobilized by um, the enormity of the problems we face, I say, you know, in every context you find yourself in, you can ask one simple question. What is the next most responsible small thing I can do? And you're not gonna solve 500 years of colonialism that way, but you're going to do your tiny part as best as you can in that context at that time. 
And then you might make a mistake, then the responsibility is to learn from this mistake. And then you ask again, okay, having done that, what is the next most responsible small thing I can do now? And this is a question that we can sit with and um, sort of adapt to our different contexts. And the answer is going to be different for me or Miguel or anyone else, right? So that's my, my response. <laughs> Thank you. Miguel, another question here. Camila says, I loved your reflections with, with this experience. She's talking about your presentation. Uh, what do you think are some ways to embrace different goals and investments in English and not silence the students in a diverse classroom? Um, well, thank you, Camila. Uh, nice. Um, hello to you there. Um, yes, Camila. Mm. And what is the purpose of the class? I always wonder when I am starting, you know, giving my lessons and I prepare the class. I don't plan. I prepare the planning different preparing because I'm, I think I'm ready. I have my, my, my plan, but you know, I prepare some things, but, um, but yeah, uh, the, I think this is the, you know, like the highest point out of my preparation when I am, you know, dealing with the objectives of the class and also to pay attention on the students who don't like the subject, especially. I mean, that's, I think that's amazing. And it really, it really catches my attention a lot because they don't like because it's English. And I realize in other subjects, they do like a lot other subjects, but I, I'm not in panic because of that. I try to do my best, but I all also, I am also very concerned and very positive of my job, you know? And I think when they are learning, they are, they are expecting something from the class. And what is this something? not speaking perfectly English, not exactly talking about, you know, other realities. They are expecting to know more about the culture. And now that I keep in mind, this is so intercultural. I mean, in an intercultural uh, point of view, I, I, I understand the great possibilities our culture can offer to the class and from the class. And yes, Camila, of course, um, some students don't like the class, it's okay, it's fine, but uh, other ones are paying attention a lot in their realities, in their, you know, um, yeah, in their contexts. And this is what I like a lot when I am, um, you know, uh, giving them the lessons, um, you know, learning with them. Thank you once again, Camila. So we have time for one more. Uh, Juma Dalla Vilarinho Pereira Borelli, she is one of our speakers as well. She will be with us at DELA. And she is asking, do you think we can delink language from power? <laughs> In a very critical point of view, uh, language as a possibility, not language as, uh, as power. Uh, not in a vertical, let's say, or in a top-down process, more in a horizontal way, but absolutely uh, power is something that embraces not just the English language teachers' bodies, but the self, I mean, inside us, and it's also a negotiation process. But absolutely, I think uh, power issues are visible not just in my class, in the school, not just in the school, in the community. But yeah, um, I try not to do, but it's uh, extremely hard because uh, as Sharon uh, mentioned, uh, it's a mistake and I can continue and I can stand up again. But again, uh, th there is something about the discipline aspects in my class. Please, shh, silence. Don't stand up, don't move, don't interact. Come on, but it's English. And I am, you know, like conducting some power issues from mm -hmm. my strategy, from my, you know, uh, teaching position. For the reason the classes are like, you know, they're like a mess. I'm sorry, I'm so honest, but yeah, uh, I mean, and there is not a specific structure and I try to avoid power issues, but I'm doing, I'm doing this job. I mean, I, 
I try to do my best to follow like my own ways and the community's needs. Thank you, Miguel. Sharon, would you like to talk a little bit more about this relation language power, the, the link? I'm I'm okay. Thank you. I'll let we the are satisfied. Yeah. So I'm satisfied as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I uh, thanks, Daniele. Thank you both, Miguel and Sharon. I just wanted to. Um, I read a comment, which is not really um, a question on the web chat, but it's more of a comment, and I think it has to do with this, um, the idea that we need to um, choose that there are options, and uh, Thais Deschamps, she's questioning if these options really do exist. She says she mentions the choice between playing the colonial game or refusing to play it and being left out. And she uh, this reminds her of Stenger's um, infernal alternatives. And um, I'm not sure if um, Sharon is going to talk about it, but I know she, she, she writes about it a lot. So I don't know if you want to comment on this, Sharon, right now, or if you want to keep your comments to your own uh, presentation today. Well, I don't know this um, Stanger's infernal alternatives, but it sounds very interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, at, 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 in any case, our choices are always shaped by our context, our positionality within the colonial hierarchy. So it's not just like, okay, I'll choose whatever I want. They're always negotiated. Um, but there are, within that sort of limited realm, different choices we can make. But we do, I think, sometimes, um, at least let's say in, in North America and in the US and Canada, um, we sometimes overstate the, the, the possibility of um, the, the impact that one person can have, which is not to say that we shouldn't act. <laughs> but um, not only overstate what one person can do, but also we think that because we say something is important to us or we're committed to something, then that means that we're actually doing it. When in reality, oftentimes we have conflicting intentions and desires within us. So part of me might want to subvert the colonial game and another part of me might want to keep enjoying the benefits of the game. So part of it is also, without becoming self-indulgent, trying to unpack the different parts of ourselves that want this part of the game or that and understanding. And it's not about um, demonizing ourselves or putting ourselves on a pedestal. It's seeing the full range within us and within everyone else of parts of us that want the, the promises and the shiny parts of modernity and the parts of us who see the colonial costs and feel that sense of responsibility to do something and understanding that we can have both at the same time. Um, and how do we then negotiate and navigate, not just with other people, but also with all the different passengers on our internal bus. So I will come back to that in my presentation. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, anything else, Daniele, that you selected? No. No, not so far. Okay. Oh, I guess we're ready for our break then. Um, you know, I call it a, a strategical break for uh, biological reasons. So feel free <laughs> to, uh, you know, just disconnect for about 10 minutes and we're coming back after these 10 minutes with uh, Sharon talking a little bit more to us about these um, non-choices <laughs> that, that we might not have <laughs> all right oh my god so thank you very much thank you miguel for your um, beautiful presentation and uh, thanks sharon for your um interaction on this bit of uh of our show today <laughs> so thank you very much see you soon in uh, 10 minutes time okay thanks everybody see you in 10 thank you yes let me just get our break slide here.
Hello, everybody. Here we are back from our break. Um, so now we're having uh, Sharon's talk for about an hour or so. And then we're, we're going to invite Miguel back in to start with the with the discussion. All right. OK, thanks a lot. So, um, yeah. Sharon, can I help you with anything? I'm going to share my screen. Can you um, let me know whether it's showing or not? Because I won't right. be able to see you. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. Okay, I just need to make it big. How about that? Yes. Great. That's working perfectly. Thank you. And thank, thank you me. once again for sharing your talk with us, Sharon. Thank you, Clarissa. Um, so welcome back, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I am Sharon Stein, and I'm going to be speaking today about um, not only my own work, but work that I do with my uh, research arts collective, Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures. Um, I think it's probably impossible to do decolonial work alone. And so um, I, I have an amazing group of people that I work with from all over the world. And I'll talk a little bit about that really informs how I approach this work. Um, before I get to that, I will just situate myself a bit. Um, I work at the University of British Columbia, which is in what is now known as Vancouver, Canada. Um, this is also the traditional ancestral territory of the Musqueam Indigenous people. And um, their request is that we begin events that happen here with an acknowledgement that this is not only their traditional ancestral territory, but still their territory, despite the ongoing colonial occupation here. And I do think it's important, uh, it always for me to recall as I start these events that um, there are these colonial conditions, historical and ongoing, that allow us to be here, not only in our different physical spaces, but also even connecting technologically in terms of the minerals that go into making the computers that we're speaking to each other across in conditions that we know are um, generally not very um, ethical. Um, so with all that in mind, um, I'm here and uh, I'm, I'm from the US originally, but I've been living in Canada for a while and keep finding myself in these conferences about linguistics, although in Brazil, <laughs> although I'm not a, a linguist or a language teacher, I'm not Brazilian, I don't speak Portuguese, although I'm getting better at understanding it. Um, so my explanation when people ask why am I here is that I'm Lynn Mario's academic granddaughter. So that's the best <laughs> introduction I can think of. Um, so today I'm going to talk again about the collective and some of the experiments, educational experiments that we have um, developed and are trying to always adapt different contexts and I'm sharing basically the learning that we've had from this, because as I mentioned in my comments before, mistakes in this work are inevitable and failure is inevitable. And rather than think of that as a problem, we try and think of its generative dimensions about what is this teaching us? So I'm going to try and share some of uh, what we've been taught by these experiments. So the collective is an interdisciplinary international intergenerational group of researchers, artists, educators, students, and indigenous communities and knowledge keepers. And we generally address questions related to this interface of systemic, historical, and ongoing colonial violence and ecological unsustainability, which are two things that are not often brought together, although many indigenous scholars have been saying this for a long time, um, for uh, global northerners and uh, settlers on indigenous land like myself, this is, this is sort of new to be thinking about how these things interrelate. Um, so our work is really about creating pedagogical practices or containers or methodologies to support ourselves and other people to develop the stamina for the long term of this decolonial work and the capacities to be able to face um, not only the colonial realities that we're currently facing, but the the sort of what we see <laughs> coming at us, which which may be what we call the end of the world as we know it, which is not necessarily the end of the world as such, but the end of 
the modern colonial system that we've had for the past 500 years. And so this is this context of potential social and ecological collapse. How do we face that without becoming immobilized, without um, giving into some of our less generative desires as we talked about last time as well, and move toward healthier possibilities of coexistence without assuming that we can prescribe what that's gonna look like. We don't know, it's all very emergent. And when we try to fix an end at the beginning, we usually uh, short circuit possibilities that are potentially viable, but unimaginable from where we currently stand in this colonial context. And the reason I say that these are contextually relevant pedagogical containers is because we are not proposing any kind of universal. Um, there is this pattern that tends to happen in even critical and decolonial work where in order to contest one hegemony, one proposes a new hegemony or to contest a universal, we propose a new universal and we're trying to avoid that uh, pothole. And so it's very important to contextualize what I'm gonna present, which is that mostly these materials are developed for those in what we call low intensity struggles. So simplistically speaking, people in the global north, but also understanding that there is the south of the north and also the north of the global south. And so we're speaking to people who may have some struggles, uh, but they're not facing constantly the threat to their life and livelihoods. Now we do a lot of our work with people in high intensity struggles, but a lot of it, what we do is translating the shared knowledge creation we make in those collaborations with people in low intensity struggles. So keep that in mind as we go through this process and perhaps situate yourselves in terms of where you think you might be and, and engage the, the materials with that in mind. So the work is of course inspired by post-colonial decolonial abolitionist and indigenous studies uh, scholarship, but also, as I said, very much by our work with indigenous communities here in Canada, in Brazil, as well as Peru and Mexico. And um, our intention, although we sometimes fail, is to avoid the traps of um, extracting knowledge from those communities um, or romanticizing those communities. What we really try to do is work um, toward a relational rigor that is grounded in trust, respect, reciprocity, consent, and accountability. Of course, that is easier said than done. And many of the materials that I'm gonna to present today are developed in the wake of our failure to do this work in an ethical way. Um, another piece is that um, sometimes, and at least here in Canada, I'll say, we narrowly think of decolonization as something that happens intellectually. And what we try to do, especially in our work, is bring together intellectual questions, yes, but also the affective piece that we also touched on in our conversation just now about our desires and about the responses that might be unconscious that come to the surface. So we might intellectually agree with something, but something in our body says, no, I'm not gonna do that because I don't wanna give this comfort up, for instance. And then of course the relational dimensions, as I mentioned as well as considering the political and ecological and economic dimensions of all this, which is not necessarily the focus of our pedagogy, but certainly informs the critique that we are then responding to. So um, again, rather than prescribe this universal pedagogy or pathway forward, we really invite people and ourselves to work with the uncertainties, the complexities, complicities and paradoxes um, in ourselves, in the context and issues we address and, and the world at large. And the, the most difficult thing is to actually stay with the work when things get difficult. It's actually relatively easy to do this in the abstract or when things are sort of going well, where there's an equilibrium. It's usually when we get challenged or when there's some kind of conflict that we start to run away. And we say, okay, that's the most important time to stay in the room. So how do we prepare ourselves to stay with it, even when it's uncomfortable, even when we're being challenged? The other thing we say is, is trying to avoid um, the response to the pathologization and deficit theorization of marginalized communities is sometimes to romanticize or idealize and we kind of see that this is not very sustainable because usually then the solidarity 
um, is contingent upon the marginalized communities living up to this impossible standard. And so once some crack shows and some uh, inter-community conflict or heterogeneity or some non-generative behavior happens, then the solidarity is, is pulled away. So we say um, everyone has within us this full range of the good, the bad, the ugly, the broken, and that includes both dominant and marginalized communities. And that can't be an excuse not to address the systemic issue. So the call for everyone to address this work with sobriety, discernment, maturity, and responsibility is for everybody. But of course, our responsibilities are not evenly distributed for the harms that we're trying to address. And then again, I don't know, I've said this now a couple of times, but we're not trying to prescribe any universal model. What makes sense here in my context is probably not gonna make sense for you in your context, but we wanna see how we can share our learnings from these imperfect examples or experiments. So um, we have a, a scholar in the US who was recently writing about the future of the educational system and, and posing this question, is it really smart to educate people to technologically and theoretically refine a system that operates by undermining the conditions of possibility for our biophysical survival? So basically what he's talking about climate change and saying, why do we keep tweaking this educational system that we have that has brought us to the, the brink of ecological disaster and even human extinction? Do we really think we can make this system work given where it has brought us thus far? And so we really find that many of the solutions that are proposed to our social and ecological problems today are coming from within the same paradigm that created those problems in the first place. That's part of the, the reason why we don't wanna prescribe a new alternative from where we stand because we know we're gonna have many elements of of our current situation there. So when we critique the system we have and we don't propose immediate solutions, we often get the question, okay, fine. If you don't want the system we have, then tell us what. And so the challenge <laughs> and our response to this challenge as a collective is somewhat counterintuitive. It says, rather than jumping to these solutions or proposing alternatives to the system, we need to first ask, how did we get here? Where are we headed? what lessons have we not yet learned that we keep making the same mistake over and over again? And what would we need to unlearn and what desires would we need to interrupt in order to actually imagine education differently? So before we can do the imagining, we have to clear some space of that colonial clutter that we've all internalized. So we say, instead of knowing the destination of decolonization or education otherwise in advance, what we need to do is walk this tight rope. <laughs> and instead of having the destination, we have a compass of sobriety, maturity, discernment, and responsibility. And these words can mean many different things, but for us, it's really about interrupting um, the, the desires that we have that are harmful, um, taking responsibility, thinking of ourselves as trying to be good elders for current and future generations to come, the discernment piece being about being able to read a context and understanding that there are many different histories and layers happening, but knowing here's where I need to intervene. That's about the question I asked about what is the next most responsible small thing I can do. And discerning that in your context is how we then approach the R of responsibility. So it's a tight rope <laughs> to try and avoid these two um, patterns that we tend to find in this work of educational and global and social change. Because on the one side, we have people desperately searching for hope. And that can be hope that we'll find this ideology that's going to tell us how to do this, that we're going to find some hero that's going to lead us out or some group of people or some practice that's going to show us this is what to do. Or perhaps we romanticize a certain time and place in the past or we romanticize a time and place in the future. So that's what we call sort of desperate hope, clinging to things that part of us knows are not really sustainable, that are probably part of the problem, but we're so afraid of going into this desperate hopelessness that we cling to that. Now the desperate hopelessness is also a problem <laughs> because we tend to get into this mode of thinking, well, if I can't change everything, then what's the point? There's no way we're gonna be able to address this mess. So why don't I just go to that hedonistic side of enjoying myself while the world burns because it's gonna burn whether I do something or not. 
or we get to this place of nihilism and also the risk of banalization of brutality, just accepting that this is how it is and what can we really do? So we're trying to avoid both of these poles and it's really difficult <laughs> um, to walk this line, but that's the challenge. And we say like, if you need, in addition to the compass, we say there's four R's that we have to work with. So one is honesty. And this comes back to Miguel's point about dealing with the reality that we actually face, being honest with, uh, I would say the depth of the problem, um, both internally and externally, um, instead of thinking of how it should be or how we wish it could be. And then of course, humility about understanding that we're all kind of fucked up and we're all part of the problem and we're gonna make mistakes. And rather than beating ourselves up about it, asking how can I move in a way that is always reflecting on the possible mistakes I'm gonna make, that's aware of how I'm being read by others and trying to do the next most responsible thing. Humor is also a big piece because these are really heavy things and it's hard for people to hold that in a heavy way. So our question is how do we hold heavy things in a lighter way? And that includes laughing at ourselves and how totally ridiculous we can be, um, especially when we're trying to look good and feel good and be these great people that we imagine that we should be. Um, so kind of seeing that we're all cute and also a bit pathetic and, and not taking ourselves too seriously while also taking seriously um, the, the, the scale of the problem that we're facing. And then finally, hyper self-reflexivity being the idea that as I said, we are going to make mistakes. We are um, conditioned by these colonial patterns. So how do we um, maintain attention to that? Not in a, an obsessive way, but in a responsible way of always asking, how am I potentially reproducing the problem? How can I be more generative in what I am doing? So that's sort of the, the overall context. Um, and we say there's two kind of capabilities we need to develop in order to walk in this direction. So one is being able to engage these difficult and painful things without becoming overwhelmed or immobilized or numb to the pain or demanding to be coddled or rescued from our discomfort, but actually working with that. So that's what we call negative capability. And then generative capability being the ability to actually navigate a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous and within that navigation, negotiating between different sensibilities, especially between communities with uneven power and doing this all with integrity and in generative ways. So it's kind of a, a big ask of us to be able to do this, but we might, we feel that we don't really have any other choice but to try given the problems that we're facing. So the rest of the time here, I'm gonna share some examples of our experiments in trying to walk this SMDR path, and as part of that, reflecting on the inevitable failures of that work. So the first example um, is a framework that we sometimes use that people often think of violence or ecological destruction as a problem of ignorance, that if people only knew the truth about where their food came from, where their computers came from, um, how many forests are being cut down, then we would change our actions. But as I mentioned before, in many cases we have this information and part of us already knows, and yet we don't necessarily change our actions. We don't necessarily change our desires. So we say that in many ways the information is there, but we are denying it. And we identify four particular denials. One is the denial of systemic violence and complicity and harm. The basic fact that the comforts and securities and enjoyments, especially that we in a place like Canada, if you're not an indigenous person, enjoy, are subsidized by expropriation and exploitation somewhere else, which can be both local and or global. Then the denial of the limits of the planet, the fact that the planet is finite and yet our economic system is premised on infinite growth. And that's an equation that just doesn't add up. Then there's the denial of our entanglement with each other. We insist on seeing ourselves as separate from each other, as separate from the land, rather than acknowledging all of the ways that we're actually interconnected, not just with other people, but with the earth itself as a living metabolism. And then this denial of the magnitude and complexity of the problem, um, seeing that there's no easy way out of this, there's no silver bullet, there's no 
um, one right action or theory that's going to get us out of this, but actually being able to sit with and work with the, the enormity of, of the scale of the problem we face. So usually when we find educational interventions, they might address one or maximum two of these. And what we're trying to do is hold all of these together and ask, where are we getting stuck in each of these points? But if the problem is denial rather than ignorance, we need a very different kind of education than we've been taught to use. So what would educational practices for addressing denial actually look like? And that requires us going beyond what is socially sanctioned, what is even articulable, what is imaginable, coherent, or deemed real in the world that we have, to also consider what is denied by us, repressed, unconscious within us. So this is sort of like, there's the visible side of the moon, but we also know there's another side that we can't see. And what is behind that? What are the traumas, fears, insecurities, fragilities, denials, neuroses, and biases that we actually need to surface so that we can clear space for something else to emerge. So one of the pedagogical containers we have for this is trying to question the modern assumptions we have that there is univocality either within a collective or even within one person, that there's coherence again within a collective or even within one person. Um, also the assumption that we can be pure good people who are just doing this decolonial work and are not part of the problem, as well as the assumption that we're transparent to ourselves, that we actually know all of the parts of the dark side of the moon within us. So in order to question these, we need to hold space instead for plurivocality, again, both within ourselves and the world, contradiction within ourselves and the world, complexity, and of course, complicity. And the way that we do that in our collective is by using this metaphor of the bus, the idea that all of us have an entire bus full of people within us, maybe not even just people, of creatures, of living beings, and they might be um, disagreeing with each other at certain times. And there might be passengers on the bus that you know really well that are usually at the front of the bus, but there also might be some at the back that you've never even seen before and only come out in a moment of crisis. So we're, the invitation is to try and get to know your bus so that you can respond in ways that account for or vocality, contradiction, complexity, and complicity in yourself, so that you can then respond to the plural vocality, contradiction, complexity, and complicity in the world. Some people don't like this metaphor of the bus. You can use whatever metaphor works for you, maybe an orchestra, a campfire, a spaceship full of squirrels, whatever <laughs> works for you. I'm gonna invite you to use the bus for this presentation, but do what works for you. So um, in order to, to kind of practice using the bus, I'm going to go on to the next example. And I would say, while you're listening to this example, uh, observe the passengers on your bus and what they're thinking, feeling, and saying in response to this next pedagogical experiment. So one of the metaphors we also use in the collective is this idea of the house that modernity built. And we use this in, in order to try and synthesize the different critiques that we have of the nation state, of capitalism, of this universal Western reason, and also this idea of separation from each other and from the earth. And you can see in this image that the, the house modernity built is taking up a lot of space on this planet, probably more than it should be. It's actually exceeding the limits of the planet. Um, we sometimes have students take a quiz, which is the ecological footprint quiz that says, tell us about your daily activities and how you live. And then we'll tell you how many earths we would need if everyone on earth lived the way that you do. Usually when I take the test, I get four. So if everyone in the, in the planet lived like me, we would need four planets. So I'm clearly using more than my share of the resources, right? Now, in addition to taking up more space on the planet that there is, there's also these hidden costs, not just to the planet, but to other people, expropriation, destitution, dispossession, and genocide. Now, people in the house generally don't see those costs because they are invisibilized, and yet the costs are there, and those who are paying the costs can see these costs very well. So not only does the house take from others, it also places its waste on others. Of course, now we're in a moment where the house itself is in crisis. We see social 
social issues, economic instability, political polarization, definitely many ecological disasters, and a global mental health crisis amongst many other things. And so what we start to see is that whereas the house had previously exported all of these problems to the rest of the world in order to sustain itself, now these problems are starting to creep into the house itself, at least into the basement, and things are looking a little bit uneven. As we face these crises of the house, we have many different responses. There are some people who say, you know what, it's not major, let's just patch it up, we'll put some new paint on it, it'll be fine. Other people say, okay, we can see that more is going to come and we actually need to protect ourselves, so let's fence it off and let's, for instance, put uh, more and more violent uh, policing at the borders of the house or the nation states that are made up of the house. Um, other people say, you know what, it's not really fair that this house is so exclusionary. We need to expand it. We're going to remodel it. We're going to add a room onto it, and that will solve our problems. Others say, you know what, maybe this house is pretty flawed, and instead of trying to fix it or expand it, we should actually build a new house, or perhaps we need to find an entirely new planet. So <laughs> there's no a singular response to what's happening in the house. And usually it depends on your social position, how bad you think the problem is. But my, my invitation to you is, as I said, to observe the passengers in your bus and how they're responding to this idea, not only that this is how the house works, but that we might be facing a, a context of the house crumbling. So I would say, in addition to observing what these passengers on your bus are thinking, feeling, and saying, I would ask, what are you learning from observing these passengers' responses? Are you finding a passenger that you didn't expect? Um, or is it confirming things that you already know that you're wrestling with? And it doesn't give you space to look at things that might be previously repressed or not invited to the table as part of this work. And I would also ask, how does it change things to observe your passengers' multiple responses rather than thinking you have to have one coherent response to the house. So some people might say, there's a part of me that is really relieved that the house is being described in this way because I know that it's the case and we never wanna talk about it. Then there could be a passenger who's like, nope, don't wanna hear it, it's too real, I can't handle it, I'm gonna have a, a meltdown if I see this. So um, how, what are you learning from observing the passengers and how does it change things for you? And you can definitely just keep this to yourself or feel free to share in the chat. Unfortunately, I can't see the chat. I can only see my slides. Um, but hopefully there's, there's things moving in your bus, um, as part of this, this invitation. So the third example that I have of a pedagogical experiment is, um, this metaphor of a seesaw. And this actually came from uh, a conversation with uh, a page in a Pitaguari community who said, you know what, we really need to get beyond this plus one, minus one thing. Everybody needs to get to zero. So what did he mean by that? So usually um, within the modern colonial system, we are working with this hierarchy. And whether or not we're conscious of it, we're always assuming that um, something is amazing or it's crap. It's this binary. And so, of course, when, uh, especially what happens when white Western folks like me start to see the reality of our complicity, we go from thinking that we were the height of humanity and they were amazing and everything is awesome, we're moving in the right direction. And instead of some kind of sober response, our response is, oh my God, I suck. I thought that I was the best and actually I'm the worst. And then we put the marginalized community on the pedestal and say, okay, they must be the best and I must be the worst. And the reality that this page was trying to bring us to is that we're all ordinary. We have this full range of humanity within us, which is not to erase at all the deep systemic divide that we need to address, but rather to say, we all need to get to this place where we realize we have the capacity for the good, the bad, the ugly, and the messed up. And how are we gonna move forward with this idea and move away from this political engagement built on the plus one, minus one, equation, which tends to be rooted in what we call the five E's. So this is exceptionalism, thinking that you're somehow better than other people. Um, we now have this idea that, you know, of merit, like we earned it, we were the most exceptional, we worked the hardest. There's also the exaltedness, thinking that we're sort of above critique. 
Um, there is the ego empowerment move of thinking if we just empowered everyone to be their best self, we would get out of this mess. Um, a lot of times politics are based on the expansion of entitlements and the externalization of culpability, always putting the problem somewhere else. So what tends to happen um, in critical and decolonial conversations in, in Canada, for instance, is that um, people either say that it's, if they're not thinking critically, they tend to put uh, white scholars, for instance, as being the exceptional exalted um, people who are, don't have anything to do with the problem. Once we get the decolonial critique, sometimes it switches and we say, oh, actually, it's the black or indigenous community that is exceptional and exalted and needs to be empowered. And our question is, how can we do a politics that doesn't work with this seesaw, that keeps the systemic question very present, but without exceptionalizing anybody because we all have um, the good, the bad, the ugly within us. Now, you could also ask what's happening in your bus in relation to this metaphor as well. How is it responding? What is it resisting? And the invitation is never for you to agree with the metaphor, but ask, what is it bringing up for you that brings to the surface that dark side of the moon so you can sit with what you're being taught by what comes up? So the next example is very contextually relevant for you in Brazil. And I actually feel a bit awkward talking about it as a US person living in Canada not being as intimate with the context as you are. But nonetheless, this is the work that we're doing and I'm gonna share uh, despite that uncertainty. So the Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures Collective is working collaboratively on this educational campaign to raise global awareness about this coordinated attack of the Brazilian government on indigenous peoples and their land and human rights. And we were, um, asked to do this by the Federation of the Hunikui Peoples of Acre, and we had pre-existing collaborations with them. And as um, the uh, Marco Temporel case came up, and as there are over 20 bills, I believe, in your Congress right now that are related to the Amazon and indigenous rights, they said, we can't do this alone. We're doing what we can in Brazil, but we need global awareness about what is happening. Now, as we supported them or are supporting them in this campaign, which we call the last warning campaign because they say, you know what, if the Amazon goes, we all go. And indigenous peoples first of all, but it's gonna have this global impact on climate change. So in trying to raise awareness about this issue, um, we have faced several different interesting challenges. The first one being the challenge of in interrupting indifference. And we find that we have shared this campaign with many people and usually at most 10% of, of the people respond when we, when we ask for their engagement or their support. And we're trying to figure out what is behind that apparent indifference. And one um, analysis we have is that part of the indifference or seeming indifference to this impending violence is rooted in denial as, we, as I said at the beginning, and a fear of the incapacity to hold um, the pain that is unraveling and has been unraveling for indigenous peoples for hundreds of years and our responsibility in causing that pain. We also know that what looks like indifference might also just be people being preoccupied with many other very pressing issues in their lives and around the world. So how do we break through um, that and respect also that people have different priorities? Um, it's also been extremely interesting, as I sort of gestured to at the beginning, of trying to uh, be this international arm of the campaign and translate across the different contexts. That's um, translating global north to global south, uh, but also again the north of the south and the south of the north, translating between indigenous and non-indigenous contexts, also between indigenous contexts of so trying to bridge for instance, communities in indigenous communities in Canada with indigenous communities in Brazil, asking what they can learn from each other in relation to their struggles, as well as generational divides of, of you know, millennials or people in my generation relating to activism and crises differently than people in older generations or younger generations. Um, and then just attending to these complexities, heterogeneities and conflicts on all sides, literally every element of the campaign, every community that we're collaborating with, both in the North and the South, 
has their own complexities and trying to respectfully navigate those um, while keeping at the fore this question of what is our responsibility in terms of trying to support this struggle against genocide and ecocide has been an extremely um, rich learning experience, but also thinking that this learning is coming at the expense of the most marginalized peoples. And that is one thing that has become very clear in this campaign that is something we always work with, but the, the realness of it has come very clear that on the one hand, the only way we learn is by making mistakes, but also understanding that those mistakes and that learning usually comes at someone's expense. And it's usually the same people who have been having things done at their expense for a long time. So we are very much still synthesizing our learning from this. I could do a whole presentation on it, um, but we are trying to synthesize the learning from this first phase so that we can support what comes next. And that is not often something that we're encouraged to do, to actually sit with what worked and what didn't work so that we can do it differently next time. But if we don't do that, we're gonna keep making the same mistakes over and over again. So the last example that I'm gonna share is actually just um, a series of, of questions for us to sit with. And much like the question I posed before about um, what is the next most responsible small thing you can do? These questions that I'm going to pose can be applied in many different contexts. And the invitation is open for you if you want to work with them. Many of what I've uh, referenced here is on our website, decolonialfutures.net. Um, but this one is what we call learning from failure. And they're actually a set of questions that we use internal in the collective to sort of peer review um, the experiments that we try, again, so that we can synthesize our learning and learn better, faster from failure, so that we can um, move towards more generative directions all the time. And the, the idea with these questions is to understand that we are always gonna be reproducing harm <laughs> in a way. And rather than try and deny that and avoid the question, let's put the questions front and center so that we can learn better and be more responsive to what's happening. So the first question is to ask, to what extent are you reproducing what you critique? So for instance, in the campaign, this is something we can ask ourselves. So we are trying to critique the systemic violence, but how might we be reproducing it ourselves? And you can ask this about a paper that you're writing or a pedagogical practice that you're, that you're working with. Then there's the question of, to what extent are you avoiding looking at your own complicities and denials? And at whose expense? When you don't look at those complicities and denials, who pays the cost? And usually, again, it's you to some extent, actually, because you're interrupting your learning, but it's also usually the most marginalized who are paying the price. Then there's just a basic question of, what are you doing this for? What drives you to do, for instance, this decolonizing work? Who are you accountable to in this work? And usually that's multiple different communities, right? What's your theory of change? What do you think um, is gonna get us from here to somewhere different? And even if we all agree that decolonization is necessary, I think as M Miguel gestured to, actually there's many different ideas of what makes up decolonization and how it should look and where it should come from. So it's important to be clear about what our assumptions are and understand that there is many different perspectives on how this work should go. And then what would you like your work to move in the world? Then there's a question about audience. As I mentioned at the beginning, our work is not meant to be universal. The, the frameworks that we present wouldn't work with the indigenous communities we work with. It's for usually people in the global north, especially the north of the north. And so always asking who's my imagined audience rather than thinking you're trying to speak to some imagined universal. What do you expect from this audience? What compromises have you had to make in order for your work to be intelligible and related to, relatable to this audience? I know that there are things that I would like certain audiences to know, but I also know that if I bring the critique too fast, too soon, then they're gonna resist and it's, it's gonna actually fall flat and I'm actually working against myself. So how do I think about the pace and the order of things in which I introduce, understanding that there's probably, for instance, a lot of complexity that needs to be there eventually, that if I started with that, it wouldn't work. 
Um, so what compromises have I had to make in terms of making my argument so that the audience can hear it? And then to what extent can these compromises compromise the work itself? At what point does it become not worth it to be intelligible to that audience? Um, and then conversely, if you're gonna make that compromise, how do you be accountable to what you have bracketed and come back to it at a later date? And then also, who are you choosing not to upset and why? There is this tendency to try and, for some people at least, keep the peace, especially from those who have potentially more systemic power than us. But when we prioritize their, um, their feelings, let's say, then we are potentially compromising the most marginalized. And in this work where we are constantly translating and calibrating for our audience, how do we do it with integrity, knowing that we're never going to be able to tell the full story at any one time and that we're always going to be making these compromises. Then there's a question, a very grounding question of what and who is this work really about and who is benefiting most from it? So in my work, um, you know, I do this decolonizing work probably for many different reasons. And I wouldn't say that my job is the main reason I do it, but it certainly benefits me to be talking about these things, especially because this question is so um, important right now in our academic conversation. So it's not what motivates me, but I have to admit that it benefits me a lot, even when I'm critiquing the system that benefits me. <laughs> How wide is the gap between where you think you are and where you're actually at? This is a common thing that happens, which is that we are not usually as far along in this process as we like to think we are. And again, when it's a calm moment and where things are peaceful, usually we can kind of keep that delusion that we are ahead of where we are but it's in a moment of crisis or conflict that we can assess where we're really at because we see how do we respond when things start to fall apart or when our authority is challenged. And how would you be able to realize where you're actually at? Usually this is by either asking or thinking of how you look to someone else's eyes. And are we really able to, um, to hear that when that critique is brought to us? So how do we, or to what extent can we respond with the four R's, humility, honesty, humor, and hyper self-reflexivity when our work in this area or when our self image is challenged? So <laughs> I know that was a lot. I feel so maybe I should have included less to give more space to sit with this, but I think we have some time now for, for questions and conversations to unpack the things that maybe I have gone over a little bit too quickly. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and um, and open it up for conversation. Thanks a lot, Sharon. It is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's too many questions and they're <laughs> so deep questions that, you know, we would, I think we would, we, we would need a whole life for some of them. And um, so let, let's see what, what came, uh, a lot came up on the on the chat. Uh, people were saying, for example, that they just love uh, the metaphors you use and uh, you know the acronyms um, and also the pictures. So they were making such kind of comments about the co the, the form uh, of your presentation and the way you explain it um, nicely, pedagogically, didactically. So thank you very much for that. And uh, Dani, are you ready to bring the questions to the screen? Yes. Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. OK. So let's start. Sharon. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. I forgot. Uh, again, I, I did the same thing the other day. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, everyone. And I'm terribly sorry, especially Miguel. It's your turn. You have the privilege to start <laughs> the debate. I'm terribly sorry about that. I did it again. You know, making the same mistake twice. <laughs> sorry <laughs> about that, Miguel. So you um, you should start. You can start uh, debating with Sharon. Yes. Um, can you hear me? My internet connection now is not very stable. Yes, yes? I can hear. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Professor Sharon, um, well, 
thank you so much for this beautiful presentation. It really, it really touched me, especially because of the natural way you, you know, you show your ideas. You um, also reflect upon our struggles in our research process, and of course, with uh, different positions. For example, uh, you know, the learner, the researcher. Uh, and, and, and you know, for me, it's like uh, very sensitive. How can I learn from the other, with the other, and of course, to the community, especially in a very ethical, in a very ethical way, being in the other shoes. But not just being the, the another person, my another, you know, agency could be there. Um, also, the metaphors, I really love it. I mean, to see, especially the metaphor of the bus, because I immediately, I, I was in, in, in that place, you know, inside the bus, and I was thinking myself, like, well, who am I? I mean, I'm the driver. I'm a passenger, I'm just a person who is chatting with other ones and you know, there are different like, uh, it was like I was in a multifaceted position, you know? Um, the collective way to do things is I think relevant in a decolonial project, absolutely. And you started the presentation with that. However, I would like to know, uh, I think it's not a very academic question, if you allow me, but I, I would like to know um, how about, how is, the, how is the environment with the other people? I mean, with your people in the research? Um, simple questions. What do you do? I mean, different when you are researching. How are these moments? Um, what are the places you were, um, you know, doing the things? but different to the research academic aspects. So this is the first wonder I would like to know, and it would be love, uh, to, you know, it would be lovely to know about, uh, you know, the different uh, situations you are sharing with your people. And finally, the pillars that you mentioned, the honesty, humility, the humor, hyper self reflexivity. And if you allow me, I would like to add another one, human, which a big age, the, uh, you know, uh, be human, be uh, the, the humanity here, because honesty plus humility, humor and hyper self-reflexivity is the human, the humankind, you know, is how to be a human in a, in a research process. Well, thank you once again, uh, Sharon. I really, I really enjoyed uh, learning from your presentation. Gracias, Miguel. Um, I'm not sure I understood the first question, so I'm going to try and answer, and then you tell me if I answered or not. Um, I think you were just, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say what I think you asked, and then you tell me yes or no before I answer. So. Um, I think you were asking just a bit more about like the sort of realities of how we actually do the research. Is that what you mean? Like with whom, where, under, okay. Um, it, go ahead. Okay. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually is this, uh, just not, not, not in the academic, you know, um, mm -hmm. in the academic event, but in other spaces or their, you know environments uh, what did you do i mean who are those people you know that co-participants uh, as far as i as i noticed okay okay it, it's really varies because we have so many different projects that are all sort of related and under this umbrella of of the collective um so for instance um one of the the uh, well one is obvious this the, the indigenous communities in brazil they they have their own network um which is called the tea da cinco curas and they have um it's interesting actually this is a good example of the 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 challenges and joys <laughs> of the translation is that one of uh, you can see that we have these many cartographies or maps or frames that we work with and um at one point we came up with uh, mostly, I would say, Global North folks coming up with a framework of how to approach our theory of change. We have the critique, in a way, the House of Modernity is our, our basic critique, but then it's 
that's the the analysis and then and then what is the question so we have this framework of five justices uh, which is ecological justice economic justice cognitive justice affective and relational justice and we were talking with the with some of the indigenous communities that we work with in brazil about this and they said mm -hmm, yeah we like your framework but we would actually we would do it totally differently number one we wouldn't use the word justice because this is a very western word to us it doesn't have as much meaning as something like well-being um, or healing would be. So it's the five healings instead of five justices, which is already taking it not just the linguistic translation, but it's actually the contextual onto epistemological translation. Um, and so we have now these sister frameworks of their five healings um, and then our five justices, which speaks to this Western Northern context. When we talk about justice, that's what people expect to hear when you're talking about decolonization or um, critical approaches, right? But then we say, okay, but they decide what works in their context. And then we, the, the frameworks sort of inform each other and we have this dialogue um, of, of how we work together. And they say, you know, this is what we, this is what is important to us, but we don't know how to translate to your context. And we see that the house of modernity is falling and it's going to fall on us again. It was already built on our lands and our backs. Now it's falling and it's gonna hurt us again. So we're gonna work with you and you help us translate back up there to say, you guys need to get your act together because you're hurting us. <laughs> You're hurting yourselves, you're hurting the planet. So part of a lot of the research work is not like what people expect, which is like some kind of ethnographic work or like just documenting this is what the community said, but it's actually this knowledge production in a very uh, imperfect translational way that's living, um, that is in many cases directed by what they want, which is like, we want you to help us talk back to the North, but we know if we just do it the way we would, it's not gonna necessarily land. Um, so I think that's just one example of, of how that research goes. I can say more if you want, but in terms of the human, I think, yeah. And I think of adding the human to the, to the list of four H's. One thing that I think I probably iterated many times in the presentation was like the problem that sometimes happens with the, this idea of we need to humanize ourselves or we need to humanize the other. And our approach is sort of like, well, sure, but that just means acknowledging in us that we have the capacity for both amazing and terrible things. It's not that we should have this romanticized idea of humanity that we're all going to arrive at, but rather the reality of what humans have actually done. So we have, um, for instance, uh, a course that we run that's called in Facing Human Wrongs. Instead of, you know, the human rights frame, it's like, flipping that and saying, okay, <laughs> what have we done wrong? What do we keep doing? And it's it's difficult because it's not as if humanity as a whole is evenly complicit in the problems that we're facing. And that always, we try to keep very visible, but it's also that we all are capable of these things. Um, so how do we sit with that and not delude ourselves into thinking that there is this plus one, minus one group, whether it's us or someone else, that's gonna show us the way out because we all have within us um, this full range. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I think the essence of reciprocity, reciprocity, is I think relevant when we are when we are doing um, the things when we are well, you know, learning from from others. And that's all. Thank you once again, uh, Sharon. Beautiful, amazing, touchy presentation, and so many ideas. I, I just grow here in my notebook and well, a privilege to be with you here. Thanks Miguel for that. Um, Dani will come up now. It's Daniela's turn to come up with the questions from the chat. Thank you, Dani. Hi again, Sharon. Sharon, when you were talking about uh, the learning from failure, Juliana asked, do you mean that humans are good and if they overcome their fears and if they overcome their fears, new possibilities will come or should we consider to how to deal with what is not good about humanity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I 
perhaps just in a way answered Juliana's question in my last response, but I'll, I can say a bit more about this too, which is, um, I mean, I would definitely agree with the latter <laughs> question more than the former, um, that we, it's not about good or bad exactly, uh, because that gets into the plus one, minus one thing, but it really is about sitting with um, the costs of, of what, um, of what our way of being has has come with it. Um, and I think one thing that working with Indigenous communities as a non-Indigenous person has um, shown me is that there are so many ways of being human. If we, if we bracket this conversation about the good, bad, the ugly within all of us, which is there, but actually see that there are so many ways, not just of thinking, but also being so many senses that there are that we in the West have totally numbed. And um, it's not to romanticize what the communities have or to say that they have the answers. First of all, it's not their job to fix us <laughs> um, or give us any answers and they are fighting their own struggles. But it is a reminder that what we actually have in, in terms of the range of possibilities or what we think of as what we can be is so narrow. And it, and we have gotten ourselves into this huge mess with this narrow range of possibilities. So the question arises, how do we open ourselves up to these other possibilities of what being human can, can look like? And how do we do that without grafting from communities doing something different back into our context, which is totally not going to work and it's not really appropriate either. Um, and one of the answers that we always come to is like, you have to clear the space first. You have to at least interrupt your satisfaction with the promises that have been made to us as a subset of humanity. If you don't interrupt your satisfaction with those promises, then you cannot have access to these other possibilities. Not really. I mean, people try. That's what happens with new age stuff is that West, right, Westerners like me go into a community, whether here in North America or elsewhere and say, okay, I like this spiritual practice. I feel a, a sense of spiritual poverty. I'm gonna use this, and but I'm gonna keep on living my life as if nothing else was different. And what I've learned uh, in working with communities is like, if you really want access to other possibilities, you do have to give something up. And that is your sense of superiority, your sense of certainty, your sense of knowing what's gonna happen, your sense of that you get to be the arbiter of justice. And most people wanna keep both. They wanna expand possibilities, but they don't wanna give anything up. So I know this is not exactly responding to your question, Juliana, but I hope you will forgive me <laughs> that we, we have to figure out how to not just pluralize different ways of thinking, but also different ways of being. But we, we can't just simply add on to this colonial mode of existence that we have. We actually have to crack that frame and see what could be beyond it uh, without assuming that we know how to go beyond. And I think in addition to this whole piece about thinking about about de-romanticizing humanity, it's also thinking about all the possibilities we're actually missing out on. That's Spivak's idea of unlearning your privilege as your loss, that there are so many possibilities we are not able to access because of it, um, but also that, that accessing those things comes at a price. And usually people want to be greedy and have it all. <laughs> and we, I don't think that's possible. And I haven't figured out how to crack my colonial mode of existence, despite really trying, <laughs> because it's not something you can really will. It's actually about surrendering something. And most people um, are not really willing to do that, even if intellectually we are wanting to go there. Brilliant. Uh, Sharon, Professor Eduardo Diniz is asking you if you can tell us a bit more about the results for the last warning campaign. Hmm. Yeah, I will. I will try my best. Um, well, 
one thing we it's many the learnings it's interesting because it's many things in a way that we knew in theory and we saw them really unfolding in practice so this question of which audience you're speaking to became very important and visible for us and we had various different videos if you go to the websites of lastwarning.org or ultimoaviso.org you can see some of these materials and how we were number one trying to think about who's gonna what's gonna speak to different audiences. So for instance, one of the videos is from these sort of elite set of academics, these they're called Canada Research Chairs, and they are giving their analysis from like legal perspectives, human rights perspectives, and ecological perspectives about what's happening there. And for many sort of let's probably predominantly white middle class Canadians, this is something that we thought might speak to them, even though it would be better to center the communities in some ways. We knew that they needed to see people like them speaking in order for it to move something. Conversely, we have also videos that are uh, led by the communities who are affected by these potential laws and Supreme Court ruling. And we showed them to some um, European climate activists and they said, well, we see that this is very serious, but we're not compelled because we don't see ourselves in this in this campaign. Like basically saying we want to see some kind of white face <laughs> in this and we can't see how it relates to us if we don't see ourselves in it. So the, the, the question of audience became um, very central and in terms of what could actually break through um, that sort of indifference, but then also this question of what are we actually trying to do with this campaign? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not a, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know what's going to happen. Um, it doesn't look like the outlook is great. And so then the question is if we cannot change the outcome of, um, you know, these rulings or these bills, what then? What is what kind? What is our responsibility? Us, particularly as people who work with these communities, but all of us as people sharing this planet, um, if we can't stop it, what is it? What is it? What kind of witnessing do we do so that we learn from what's unfolding? Finally, how many more times does it have to happen? Um, and what does a campaign that is inviting us to a space of sobriety, maturity, discernment, and responsibility look like when usually campaigns are sort of like, do this and check this box and that's your, what you're done or post this on your Instagram and you'll feel great. But it's actually, the communities are saying, we don't just want to stop what's happening. We actually need you all to grow up and, and see how you're part of this problem. Even if you're on our side of this, of this, uh, of these rulings, you're also part of the problem, like us in Canada consuming beef and soy that's grown in Brazil that would be coming from, you know, the deforested part of the Amazon. So I think the, the next sort of emerging phase is how do we um, invite people to see how they're part of this problem and say that if this is going to unfold, then what? How do we prepare to actually not turn away from, from the violence um, that is again, has been unfolding for 500 years, but is intensifying this current moment. All right. Um, another question here, this is related to schooling, Sharon. How do you see the possibility of teachers giving up on schools? It seems we are always rethinking schools, but it's always a never ending cycle, as you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's so my technical area of expertise is higher education. So I always borrow from, from um, K through 12 schooling folks, this idea of education being different from schools. <laughs> I say higher education is different from universities. So I, I coming at this in a parallel way. Um, and I think the answer is number one, that there are multiple different strategies and we number one need to be aware of that, um, this heteroglossia of different approaches to interrupting the coloniality of schooling. From my personal work in the university, I have sort of a dual, dual-sided dual approach. One is let's reduce as much harm as we can while we're still here. And that is that goes back to what Miguel and I talked about in the initial conversation of making people aware of the colonial game and its costs and inviting us to somewhere different without uh, compelling people. It's the uncoercive rearrangement of desires of Spivak, but also seeing that 
I don't know about K through 12 schools, but when I think about the university, it may not survive the fall of the house modernity built. And if that's the case, um, what do we do? How do we hospice the university? So not try and kill it preemptively, but also not keeping it on life support longer than it needs to be. Um, and what would it mean to disinvest from the futurity of, of the university um, without necessarily leaving right away, but saying we are working toward a different world, which may or may not include this particular institution. Thank you, Sharon. Miguel, are you still here with us? I have another question now, but the destiny is Miguel. So Clarissa, would you like to join us now? Yes, perhaps we could um, ask Sharon a question uh, that Alice, um, let me see. Alison made, um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, like the, the three messages? Yes. <laughs> Do uh -huh. you have it there? Uh-huh, yes. It was about that research, uh, that, that kind of survey. Yes, exactly. So here's the number one, Sharon. When you showed these tests, people might take to examine how impacting consumerism is to the environment. And he continues. I thought some people might feel they are being made responsible for a cost that's everyone's, not only theirs. The logic is that they individualize a collective behavior. And finally, do you, do you feel that individualizing the influence we exert to the environment is an adequate strategy to raise people's awareness? Okay, great questions. Um, well, one of the, so with any educational resource, I think we always ask like, how do we need to frame it in order to have it be the most generative sort of learning experience it can be? So one of the things with the ecological footprint test, as well as there's a, a slavery footprint test about how many modern slaves your lifestyle requires, is that we frame these as imperfect tools that, um, do you have one one piece being the risk of individualizing behaviors or this desire to say, okay, well, what can I do so that I only consume three planets worth of stuff instead of four? And we say it's not that it's bad for you to think about how your individual behaviors are contributing to this or to use less plastic or whatever it is that people want to do to reduce their personal impact. Um, but we also want people to actually sit with um, how they're responding. So for instance, even this response of people saying, oh my God, I can't believe I use so many planets. How many um, things can I recycle to address that? That's something we want them to actually observe in their self, this desire for this quick solution, because we can't sit with the fact that ecological destruction is here and it's not going away. We are in this global political economic system that is going to continue uh, producing harm. And there are things we can do as individuals. There are things we can advocate for collectively in terms of government policies. But at the end of the day, from our pedagogical approaches, we actually have to learn to exist together and in relationship to each other and the earth differently. That's the kind of one of the central messages of the communities that we work with, which is like, yes, do all the things that sort of Western political modes of engagement tell you to do. It's not that we're demonizing them or saying they're useless. It's just, we are saying, if we don't get at the core of this, which is this question of separability of ourselves from each other and from the earth, we're not gonna have a different possibility. And in the meantime, we are gonna face these ecological uh, disasters. So there's an indigenous scholar in, in the US, uh, Kyle White, who talks about the fact that people are sort of obsessed now with this idea of avoiding the ecological tipping point after which um, there would be all these in exponential uh, expansion of climate impacts. And he says, OK, we could focus on that, which would require huge mobilizations of governments of changing of economy and everything else. But if we did that without addressing the relational tipping point, that we crossed 500 years ago that we continue to breach every day, 
we're not going to have something different. We're going to make more and more violence. And we may avoid the ecological tipping point, but at what cost? And he says, and it's not an either or, but he says, if we focus on the relational tipping point, because it takes time to build trust, respect, reciprocity, consent, and accountability, we might actually breach the ecological tipping point. But at that point, we would have the relationships that would allow us to actually face the crises that are coming our way in a very different way than if we only focused on sort of these ecological measures. So I think it's trying to not say that there's only one way of doing this, but to expand people's ideas of what the root of the problem is and the possibilities for addressing it. And absolutely part of that is interrupting this assumption that individuals or even governments can stop um, this unfolding ecological catastrophes. Do, do you think we have time for that? I mean, hmm. is an extinction coming before we can do anything about it? I mean, okay, so <laughs> one thing that I, as I said at the beginning of the talk is like, or I think it may be even the, in the name of the talk, I can't remember what this talk is called, but about the end of the world as we know it. Um, and, and I said, I'm not talking about the end of the actual world, just the end of this, this system that we have. However, there is certainly a possibility of the end, not of the world, because the world doesn't need humans, but of human extinction. And I think that um, I don't necessarily lead with that because leading with the end of the world as we know it is already jarring for many people. But this, I think it's a possibility that we are facing um, a human extinction. And then I think my question is, if we're headed in that direction and there's no stopping it, then what? And how, how do we hospice humanity, not just the university? Because we can go down killing each other fighting over the last resources, which we're already sort of doing, or we can go down in a different way, finally learning the lessons <laughs> that we refuse to learn for so long. And I, the idea that we are going to plan for what that looks like, I, I don't think we can, but part of our work as in the collective is how do we prepare ourselves for whatever is coming? And it might be the end of this modern system, or it might be the end of humanity. And if it's the end of humanity, what is that going to look like? I think that part, we still have some possibility of changing the course of the direction. But perhaps the, the thing is sinking regardless of what we do. But how do we go down? Do we go down in a different way? Or do we go down repeating the same patterns that um, that we've been doing for at least 500 years? Yeah. It, might, it might not make a difference to the fact that we are going down. <laughs> but it might make a difference to us, to what we learn from the fall. And how we go down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, take your point. Yeah, I kind of, sometimes I hope humanity is uh, facing extinction. <laughs> it's kind of a hope sometimes. Um, I don't know, Miguel was here and then he left. Miguel? Yes, he said he, he was having some problems with the connection. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. There was there, there's a question for him as well here. So that's yes. why we wanted him to, to come back. Mm -hmm. No more questions to Sharon, but so many comments. One person here is just a suggestion that we can create our collective buzz to not to not fall in a the colonial blah blah blah. And <laughs> Anderson Marquez is saying that we are so there are so many levels of interpretation and possibilities out there, and I believe acting locally is always a great way to start and gain force for bigger and more impactful action. So, in general, people are very happy with your participation here with us, Sharon. Unfortunately, we don't have time to think enough about this topic because we have Della again tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, just just one, uh, let me just take advantage of my position here being on screen. And um, to ask you another question, um, Sharon, you mentioned translation and mm -hmm. you mentioned the need to translate um, between collectives, mm -hmm. basically. And you, you also talked about epistemological translation. How does that happen? How how did 
negotiating meanings um, happen between the different um, groups or collectives? Mm -hmm. um, it depends because like, especially when you're building the trust, there is a lot more back and forth of checking in. Is this okay? And even at that time, there's some time, usually there's some degree of, well, I don't know. You tell me, is it going to work or not? <laughs> um, and then luckily by the time, for instance, the last warning campaign come up, we had enough trust that there were certain times like timeliness was an issue and we just had to say, let's, let's just do it. And then we would check later and make sure it was okay. Just so that if it was wrong, we would learn from the mistake. <laughs> but that is the, the importance of building the relational rigor, the trust, respect, reciprocity, consent, and accountability. So that when it's necessary to, to not always have the immediate consent, you know, you have the, the general mode. But I think one thing that we try and honor is that there's, because it's not a literal translation, um, which is what people usually want, they want the form, they want to know, okay, tell me about this indigenous theory or this indigenous practice. And sort of like, that's impossible. Like number one, for me to even grasp like a kernel of it, let alone for me to try it and translate and for someone who wasn't even there to, to get the sense of. So what, the, what my understanding of what the community are asking of us is like, we want to number one move in this direction this you know sobriety maturity discernment and responsibility direction and whatever you think within reason is going to move that way then we trust you to to try it out understanding that there's going to be mistakes and things and so how do you honor the movement of of their theories and their practices understanding that when we bring them to this context in Canada, for instance, it's going to look very different, but can it resonate with what's happening there and have the same vibe or, or frequency? Um, it's not going to be, it's not going to look the same. The form will be very different, but how do you honor the integrity of the movement, which is not something that we're very used to doing in the West. We want this literal word for word, even though everything is basically lost when we do it that way. Not everything, but much is lost and dishonored when we do it that way. And so we're trying to honor, not in a literal sense, but in terms of, of the direction and the movement that they're, that they're going in. Mm -hmm. So do you ever discuss the role of language in all that? How important mm -hmm. is to think about what language is and how it works? Um, for you to build this kind of um, collective, um, it's not consensus, but the, 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 this kind of um, trust. Mm. Uh, I mean, there are lots of people and like, I, at this point I can, I can understand, you know, some Portuguese, I'm a terrible speaker, but like when you were doing your introduction, Clarice, I, I followed most of it because I knew also the content. <laughs> But there are people in our collective that that we go when we go to Brazil, they don't speak a word of Portuguese or Spanish or anything, and they still are very much connecting and involved in the work that we're doing. It's not the same, of course, as if you can actually get the full context with the language. Not to mention many communities, you know, Portuguese is not their first language in the first place. But um, there are ways of communicating that are beyond language. And then the, what is the role of language then? And part of it is language as something that moves things as opposed to like describing the world, language as moving things in the world. And then you don't get as so attached to this or that word. And you see also how words move. For in, again, this idea of decolonization meaning 30 million different things at this point. And on the one hand, we don't, we, we wanna contain that a bit, but we also can't, there is, so much cacophony that if we get too attached to this word or spend too much time on trying to define what it means, then we, we spend all our time doing that and it actually doesn't do much. So, yeah, so uh, hmm. that, that's the, 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 the very idea of the concept of language, what language hmm. is and what it does. I think it's extremely important when you have these different communities uh, hmm. or collectives um, being in contact, which is not just a matter of transposing meaning from one to the other, 
but it's re-signifying meaning. So every time um, we, we had a, a similar discussion here, we, we discussed this a lot, you're, you're with a, a group of applied linguists here, um, so this is pretty much on our plate. And um, for us, uh, language is meaning, it's a practice that constructs meaning. Mm -hmm. So um, named languages do not guarantee the fact that you're, we are speaking the supposedly same named language, English, has no gives us no guarantee that we will understand each other. So it's much more an effort, the effort of trying to be with the other <laughs> that is going to help us then, you know, whether you're using one or the other language. But this is for the future. We're going to, we might have, you know, a whole discussion only about the role of language. It's just that I think that for you, working with just different mm -hmm. collectives and, you know, moving through them, um, you know, thinking about language and how we, language impacts all these movements would be really uh, important and interesting. <laughs> You'll make a linguist of me yet. Sorry? You will make a linguist of me yet. We might one day, who knows? I think you already are a linguist. It's just that you are not aware of that. <laughs> Because for us, being a linguist, an applied linguist, means exactly that. You know, being concerned with plurality, uh, with fights against capitalism and patriarchalism and all, you know, colonialism and all this. So all this is applied linguistics for us. So I'm sorry to say that you are already an applied, a Brazilian applied linguist. Okay. <laughs> You've been promoted, Sharon. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, just kidding. There's no promotion involved here. Um, so, yeah. um, I think that we can, uh, you know, just close the day, um, the afternoon at least, and uh, Miguel is still not around, so maybe we can send him the question and the uh, email of the person who asked the question, and he can uh, reply directly. Um, so, Sharon, is there anything you would like to add, any comments you'd like to make so that we can wrap up the afternoon? Just thank you very much for having me. Um, I, yeah, I, I was very happy to be here and I learn always so much from, as I say, this context that's very different from my usual one, but I'm always delighted to share with you and, and think through your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. We know you're always willing to share. That's why we keep asking you <laughs> to come. We <laughs> so thank you very much. Thanks everybody on the on the chat. Um, there's more to come tomorrow. So hope to see you all here again tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, Dani, anything else that you wanted yes, to add? Yes, I, I was going to say that we say many things and I was going to invite her to be here with us tomorrow again because tomorrow we're going we're gonna to have her grandfather, as she <laughs> said. So tomorrow, <laughs> Lin Mario is one of the speakers. So okay. let's just remind uh, our public that the, the talks we're going to have tomorrow. So tomorrow, Lin Mario and Camila House uh, from 2 p.m. We're going to be here waiting for you. Oh, there's Miguel over there. <gasps> Hi. Hi, <laughs> okay, Miguel. So maybe, maybe we have, do we have to, yeah, we do have time for, uh, for his question. Welcome back, Miguel. I think he can't listen to us. No. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even know he's on the screen. Okay. He does. He doesn't. He does. He does. Are you there listening? Yeah, I'm sorry. So many internet problems here at school, but yeah, I could hear you. Okay. Uh, well, thank we you. Have an extra about question for you. Yeah, could you do me a huge favor? Can you please send me uh, to my mail? Because look, the time and I think my internet connection is like okay. unstable. It's not, okay. you know, very Thanks fine. Thanks a lot. We'll do that. All again. right. Uh, just to tell you, thank you. Thank you again and again and again. Um, something happens here every time, and it's a privilege 
to to be with you learning with you and of course um so challenging events that you are promoting and well a big hug from colombia from bogota and well i hope to see you soon okay thanks a lot so thank you everyone and see you all tomorrow i'm going to end transmission now see you